Welcome to our midweek devotion. Hope everyone's healthy and safe and warm. We certainly had some strange weather today. I had to get up this morning and go to work for a short four-hour shift. As I was on my way to work this morning at 2 o'clock in the morning, the temperature was in the upper 30s. There was no wind blowing. It was actually a pretty nice, pretty nice weather for this time of year. Four or five hours later, when I got off from work, it was snowing, just like January all over again. Uh, although it wasn't quite as cold as it was in January. But it certainly was not what I was expecting to see. By the time I got back home in Cows, it was a nice little coat of snow on the ground. Still some coming down. Lay down and took a nap. A couple hours later, I woke up. The sun was out. The snow was gone. Patches of blue sky. What a, what a shift. What a change in our weather today. When Becky and I moved up here 30-something years ago, one of the things that people told us was, if you don't like northwest Indiana weather, just wait a day or so, it'll change. And that certainly hasn't been the case this year. We're continuing to have good services on Sunday morning at our church. Uh, I encourage all of those that uh, want to come, please come. They've been very good services. Those that want to continue to stay at home, continue to do that. Do what you feel is best for yourself. But all parts of the service, whether it's the music, the preaching, or the fellowship, has been very encouraging. We've had good attendance. We have opened up and started having a children's church on Sunday morning, which is from toddler age up to the fifth grade, and we're thankful for the workers that are working with that. We're looking, for, uh, looking forward to the time in May when we'll, we'll be able to resume our Wednesday evening uh, prayer service. Uh, I believe it's going to be from 7 to 7.45 or 8 o'clock. We'll have a, a devotion and we'll have prayer. This is something that will be exciting. And then there are other plans uh, being made for other activities to, to start later on the summer. And we will keep you updated as, as more information becomes available. On Sunday morning, for the last three months, Pastor Mitch has been preaching from the book of James. And as I was thinking about the book of James, it's, it's really a book that's focused on practical faith, practical Christianity. This is where what you believe, where your faith is evident in the way that you live your life every day and with the opportunities that you face. And as I was thinking about what Pastor Mitch has been preaching on, I was thinking about, I've been a, I've been a Christian for over 40 years, and I was thinking, you know, how many sermons how many Sunday school lessons, how much time have I spent in the Bible in that 40 plus years? And I said, well, with all the reading, with all the listening, with everything that I've been exposed to, how much have I really put into practice? I think this is something for each one of us at some time or maybe many times to consider. Is there evidence that what I have listened to has really had an effect on me uh, as a person and as a, uh, as, as a Christian? I'd like to share a story with you about a, uh, a professor, and he was teaching a divinity class. Actually, it was at Harvard. At one time, Harvard was considered to be one of the premier uh, universities in the country for going to for uh, to be involved in the ministry. And he, uh, he, he wanted to work with the, the, the group of students that he had, and he developed a, uh, a class that was entitled Christianity, Christians, and Faith. It was a 15-week class. And throughout the course of this class, he had, he had special guest speakers that came in, noted pastors, other people that were very, very knowledgeable about Christianity and, and just had uh, skills to be able to teach these students. And they came and they made their presentations to the class and they talked about different uh, different things on Christianity, faith, trust. And, and, and practicing the word of God or being a moral Christian. A moral Christian means that uh, as you have opportunities to, to help other people, to be involved with other people, and also to, to live your life in a way that shows that the, the teachings of the Bible are, are evident. 
at the end of this 15 weeks, he developed a four-hour test on being a moral Christian. And it was based upon all the lectures and the lessons and the studying that these students had to do. And the test was going to be four hours long. And halfway through the test, at the two-hour two mark, there was going to be a 15-minute break. And he let them know that there was going to be a 15-minute break. And he had made the test difficult. He wanted them, he wanted them to be challenged by it. When the two-hour mark came, they were all glad. They were ready for a break. And the professor told them that they had 20 minutes for the break and told them that refreshments and snacks were prepared for them right outside the class uh, in the area there, but they only had 20 minutes. And he told them that the test would resume promptly at the end of the 20-minute break. But there's one thing he did not tell the students, and that, that was that the break was also going to be part of the test. The professor had set up ahead of time a young man in the court in this in this outside area, we'll call it a courtyard, and he was dirty and he was ragged and he was rumbling and picking his way through the garbage just like he was looking for food. He also had a man that was placed at a distance but close enough to be seen lying in the bushes and he was moaning and he was making sounds of just being, you know, really uncomfortable, hurting. Now these students on their break saw that young man looking in the garbage and they heard the moans from the bushes. Yet they drank their beverages and ate their snacks and ignored the both of them. At the 20 minute mark, they hurried back into the classroom to finish taking the test on being a moral Christian. As they all sat down in their seat and picked up their pencils uh, to begin, the professor said to them that the test was over. Everyone is dismissed and that all would receive the same grade of F because all of them had failed. Well, the class was, the class was shocked and confused. And some said, but it's not over. We still have questions to answer. There are two hours left. And they also said, you haven't even looked at our paper. So how can we all have the same grade? And the professor said, I had you to sit and hear great lectures and talks on the subject of being a moral Christian. You had, you had engaging discussions on this subject. You wrote papers on this subject. I want you to look out the window. That young man who looks messy and disheveled and the tattered gentleman looking through the garbage and that man that was over in the bushes are staff members here at Harvard and they were part of my test. You passed them by. You ignored them. And you made no effort of all to help them in any way. You have, been you have been in class all these weeks learning and listening, but when the opportunity came, you demonstrated that you have more learning to do. So the lesson for the, for the disciples was that practical faith is more than just listening and learning. It's taking what you've learned, what you've listened to, and using it in practical everyday ways. In the book of Mark is a example of Jesus doing something like this with his disciples. You know, everything that Jesus did had a purpose. He didn't do anything by accident. And in Mark chapter 4, it tells us that Jesus was, he was talking to a large multitude. In chapter 4, verse 1 says, and uh, there was gathered unto him a great multitude so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land, and he taught them many things by parables. Now, the first parable he taught them was the parable of the sower, where, the, the, of course, the, the seed represents the word of God, and the different types of ground are the responses that the, uh, that the word of God receives when it's sown. But in verse 10, it tells us, And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked him of the parable. So this tells us that at some time Jesus was able to 
come in out of the ship and he was back on land and he took his 12 disciples and there were other people with him, but it was not the, the same size, the same group of people earlier. And they asked him about the parable. And this time he, he explained to them about the, the parable of the seed and the sowing. And when you get to verse 20, he talks about the good ground. And he says, and these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. So when you think about hearing the word and the gospel and accept Christ as your Savior and you set out to live the Christian life, it's like that seed being planted. We know that when a seed's planted, it goes on the ground. It, it's just a seed. There's really nothing that, that it can do until it receives moisture and it germinates and it starts putting out a root system and then it starts growing. So it starts out small. But at the end of that verse, it said, and some brought forth fruit and brought, no, it said, and brought forth fruit, some 30 fold, some 60 and some 100. What does the fruit, re fruit represent? It represents the, the presence and the effect of their faith, not only in their life, but in the lives of others around them. You know, and Jesus, was, this is one of the things that Jesus talked about several times, about, the how, about how our faith should be evident to people around us, that we do have a relationship with him and a relationship with God. And the next thing he talks about is the, is a candle or a lamp. How that when you light a candle or a lamp, you don't put it under a bushel basket, you don't cover up, you let it shine. But when it comes to our faith, our faith is what puts out the light of our relationship with Jesus and the effect that it has on us. So I, I thought about myself, well, how has my light been? You know, have you ever picked up a flashlight that, has, that you haven't turned on in six months or a year and you've turned it on, and it's just a real dim, wimpy light. It's really not good for anything. So so what's happened? Well, the flashlight has, has not been used. The battery has died down. And that's the way it can be with our faith. And so Jesus said that really our faith should be a bright light. And that light represents the our using our faith in our lives, not only it not only for us, but also as as, a rep, as as we come in contact with other people around us, as we have opportunities to exercise our faith. And then after that, he talked about the mustard seed. And we know that the mustard seed is one of the smallest seeds in the, in the plant kingdom. Yet, like, a, like other seeds, once it germinates and it starts growing, it can be tall enough that birds can build their nests in the branches. And this was to encourage us and to help us to realize that our faith starts out that way. But when you take these three things and you compare it to what James teaches, you know, James, one of the things that James said was, it's real easy to say you have faith, but what is the evidence? What is the proof of that faith? It's how you use it when you have the opportunities in your daily life. Now, immediately after Jesus had finished teaching to his disciples and, and the other people that were there, it tells us in verse uh, 35 of Mark chapter 4, this is what Jesus said. Uh, he said, In the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And he was talking about crossing over the Sea of Galilee. So they went down and they got in the ship and they, they started going over. Now, the disciples were made up of people from all different types of, of occupation. Some were tax collectors like Matthew, but there were some like Peter and James and John and Andrew. They were experienced fishermen. I mean, they knew the Sea of Galilee like the back of their hand. They had been out there when there had been bad weather. And so they're crossing over and a big storm comes up. And this was a storm that was very windy uh, the waves were so tall that the water was starting to come into the ship. And, and what was the response of the disciples? They were scared. They thought they were going to die. And what was Jesus doing? Well, he was sleeping. He was tired from teaching all day. 
And so it says in verse 38 that, uh, that he was in the, the rear part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they woke him up and they said, Master, don't you care that we perish? Now, I really thought this, this was really, you know, it's almost like the disciples woke him up and they accused him of being negligent as their master and taking care of them. It's almost like it was like, see, they're saying it was like Jesus' fault that they're in this situation. But I believe it was Jesus. I believe Jesus was involved in them being in this situation. Because Jesus was putting them in a situation. They had an opportunity to put into practice what he had been teaching them about faith. They didn't realize it, of course. But sometimes things happen to us in our life unexpectedly. And we wonder why. And it could be God could be Jesus putting us in a situation to test us, not to tempt us, but to test us. What was Jesus' response? Was he angry at them? It says in verse 39, And he arose, and he rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace be still, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. I believe you could have heard a pin drop. I mean, when he, when, he, when he stilled the storm, it was completely still. I believe the water was like, like glass. And then what did he do? Well, he looked at them and he said, Why are you so afraid? How is it that you have no faith? Jesus used this as a teaching moment for his disciples. They had listened to everything he had said. And they had probably asked him questions. And yet when the time came for them to use what they heard, to step out on faith, they failed. And being honest with you, there's been many times I have failed in my faith too. And probably all of us, if we, if we stop and look at back at our, at our lives and living as a Christian, there's times that our faith has not been what it should have been. But we serve a very, very patient, very understanding God, and he understands that. So really, the, the purpose of the devotion was for us to stop and think about, you know, not only what Pastor Mitch has been preaching the last two or three books out of the month, out of the book of James, but really all the things that we've learned, everything that we've heard throughout the years. Do we, do we use them in a practical, everyday way as we live our life? We all have opportunities to represent Christ every day. And so, let us be more, let us be more aware of the fact that, that our faith never reaches a point that we can say it's as strong as it can be. We continually have to be looking at, looking at it as the fact that we need to exercise it, we need to grow it, we need to use it. And I believe that this is something that can help us have a closer relationship with our Lord and, and know him in a more personal way. But it also helps us every day as we meet people, as we come in contact with people, being able to say the right word, being able to do the things that can help them. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this. Uh, I, hope, I hope you continue to listen to Pastor Mitch as he finishes the book of James. It is a book that has a lot of uh, teaching, a lot of good information that can help us as we, as we try and live our Christian lives. Hope to see you this Sunday. Hope everyone stays safe and well.